five, four, three, two, and one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Art of Move podcast with myself, Anthony Manuel, my good friend, Dr. William Raybar, out there in the Canadian Rockies. I'm still in Mexico for one more day, and then I'm back in the Canadian Rockies, and we are on episode 52. It's our first solo episode in a while. We had some really great guests on the last few times, and they really got us thinking. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the differences between fascia and muscle. We're going to talk about logical fallacies, confirmation bias, how to think critically for yourself and question your own beliefs about the body, about biomechanics, and talk about the importance of having an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out. Um, that's... Uh, <laughs> That's sort of the balance that we try to strike, right? We want to be investigative. We want to be open. We want to be inquisitive. We don't want to dismiss anything just because there's no peer-reviewed medical evidence of it um, because that's you know the origins of new thoughts, of new ideas. It's challenging current beliefs and current ideas. However, we don't want to be you know so open-minded that we lack logic as well. So uh, the first kind of thing that I wanted to get into, Will had a really cool post where he had a, I think it was a lamb leg that you had that you were having for dinner and you, yep. you, you were pulling the fascia apart on, and I can actually pull it up as well, but, um, you were, you were kind of doing a visual demonstration of the differences between fascia and muscle. And when you posted that, we kind of had a bit of a discussion about, um, you know, the differences between enervated fascia tissue, as in that casing that. For those of you who are just listening that didn't listen to our multiple episodes on fascia, fascia is the sort of connective tissue that encases muscle. It is innervated. It, it, it is responsible for all the elastic energy in your tissue. Um, and then your, mu your muscle, the muscle fibers, those are actually surrounded by the fascia. Um, and we were kind of talking about the differences between how your fascia are innervated and how your... Um, how your muscles are innervated, right? So your muscles and your fascia are both innervated. We were kind of speculating on the, the, the sort of connection between how those two are, are correlated. So just off the top of your head, are there any thoughts that you have presently um, about, about this post or about fascia and muscle? What have you been thinking about lately? Yeah, it's just more like uh, some of the questions I got with regards to how to train it. So basically the, the muscle, the meat sits inside the fascia that encases it, right? And in between the meat itself, the meat cells, there's also fascia. So it's, it, it's a fractal system, okay? Now, the meat inside only contracts. It doesn't have, like, at the actin and myosin level, there's no intelligence to um, whether it's isometric, uh, you know, eccentric or anything like that. It doesn't contract like that. It only contracts. The forces that are put upon the body is what dictates what type of contraction is going to happen. Mm. So, for example, if you're running down the hill, the muscle inside the fascia still contracts. It's doing that. However, the fascia, the connective tissue on the outside, has to go through a stretch. Now, I, I'm not throwing away the fact that the muscle contracts and it's important because it is. It actually may have a lot to do with how much tension is on the outside. Let's say you have a huge muscle on the inside. Mm. The outside encasing is going to be more tense. So, yeah, so there's implications there to muscle size, how it how it contracts, the speed it contracts, all that. But it, it is a simple contraction mechanism on the inside. Right. The so outside the, is where... Sorry, so go ahead. Your, your fascia does not have any contractile tissue in it, and that's something that's really important to know. It's actin and myosin, which is the muscle tissue. This this arrow here that's pointing to the muscle tissue, that's, that's actin and myosin which are the, you know, the, uh, the constituents of, of muscle fiber. And those are the things that are actually contracting or relaxing, whereas the fascial tissue is the connective tissue that wraps around it and it behaves elastically and it's, it's the connective tissue, right? It doesn't, fa do you, would you say fascia tissue does not contract or relax necessarily other than its elastic qualities? There's controversy over this. I think it does a little bit. I, I think it does have some motor units. Um, I don't think that's its primary role. But I think it's it's like an electrical system, right? So um, how do I say this? Uh, basically, the the inside responds to the outside. The outside has a lot of sensory nerves. That's where you get your information about where you are in space, okay? Um, the inside is more actual firing, just like I should say less intelligent firing of the muscle. The outside is an electrical system. You get your sensory information, which is electrical information that relays either to your spinal cord or to your brain or both. 
Mm. So I've heard that the uh, fascia has 12 times the sensory nerve endings as the muscle, like in comparison to the muscle. Mm. Interesting. So, yeah. so if we're going to make an analogy, then you could say like the brain or like the nervous system is the pilot. The, um, the fascia is the controls and then the muscle is sort of the machine that's executing the controls. Is that sort of a decent analogy? Um, or yeah, like I, I guess you can put it like that. Um, uh, yeah, no, that, that's a good analogy. I wouldn't say it's the best just because the, I, I think I know why the limit, like, yeah, it's not, it's not the best analogy because there's still the, you know, I, I guess the machine, like it's not really a machine or a control system. Like you're actually, you're, you're, uh, you're nervous. If you're saying the nervous system is the pilot, the fascia is still an extension of the nervous system. So there's still this, like there's a simultaneous react. You can't really separate the two as like exactly. one's the driver and one's the the mechanism, right? It's, it's a little bit more difficult to do that. So it is a, it maybe, maybe a more poor analogy, but what you're saying is you're, you're getting this sensory information by what the fascia is doing, how it's behaving, how it's reacting, how it's stretching out where it is in space. Mm -hmm. So the proprioception, the, the lengthening of it, that's all sending nerve signals and information. And then the muscles, the motor units in the, with the, the actin and myosin that basically just contract or relax, those are getting that nervous system input from the, the innervated fascia. And it's behaving in response to the behavior of the fascia or the sensory input that, that the fascia is getting. Is that kind of the idea? That I couldn't put it better myself. That was exactly what I meant. <laughs> okay, so, cool. Yeah. I couldn't that's say. That's, 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 right. I, that's what I was, that's what I was aiming for. So what, yeah. what are the implications of this? You know, there was one person that said, explain why running downhill implies more connective tissue work than doing a bicep curl. Yeah. So uh, that's what I mentioned before with the, the inside just being contracting, right? So what I meant there was a bicep curl where you're, you know, the concentric, I'm going to pump iron type thing, right? So on the way up, the muscles just contracting, there's not a lot of force on the connective tissue itself other than the muscle contracting within the belly itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if I was to run down a hill and let's say I'm looking at the quad, right. And my leg has to lengthen at, at fast speed and force. And, uh, the connective tissue just got to pull super hard, right? So that's just more force on the connective tissue. Let's say you did 10,000 steps down a mountain or something like that. That is a lot of pull 10,000 times that you pulled the connective tissue really hard and really fast. And that is a lot of damage on the body. That's why people are saying, or it's generally known that eccentric training is a lot more damaging than concentric training than just contracting the muscle. Right. And concentric training doesn't really work for me as much in actual movement. Right. That's why. And, and this is the reason why here. So, this is this is really interesting because I think the implications when I think of concentric training, um, we in one of our episodes talked about the difference between like a bilateral squat and the biomechanics of running, right? Mm -hmm. And you were like, well, the thing is, you can like the argument, the counter argument for squatting bilaterally is that you're going to be able to load the muscle more. You can load it the most, but then the issue is the biomechanics don't transfer, so that optimally you would load it in the pattern of running or the pattern of locomotion. Mm -hmm. uh, someone uh, responded to that I, when I, I posted it on Instagram and on TikTok, one of the TikTok comments was like, okay, so your part two is obviously going to be how you load it in the, the running position, right? And I, and I thought about it. I was like, okay, well, I want to say pushing a sled, right? But even pushing a sled is it feels like it's more of a, a concentric dominant movement because there's no necessarily deceleration. You're literally pushing this sled there's it, it feels like a very very concentric with no eccentric action of the leg um, yeah. whereas running has an eccentric action of deceleration and of you know controlling the joints in a particular way so how would you say you can you can sort of emulate the the loading of locomotion without being concentric dominant um well, I mean, you could do things like plyometrics, right? Mm. Uh, in locomotion patterns, but really run slowly or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like progress it up like you do anything else because your fascia, like we're looking at a lamb leg right now. Let's pretend it's, you know, a human cadaver, right? Um, we're still looking at a human cadaver. So we're talking tissues. Mm. Um, but in the real life, 
you want to, we're, we're going to move into neurological patterns because that's part of living, right? You have to do the movement that you want to get good at or that you want to shape your body into. You want to behave like the properties of the fascia that you want, whether that be movement, whether it be how you move elastically or in compression, like in a squat. Mm -hmm. So in, in reality, you want to get as close to the movement as possible while you're training it. And, and that includes an eccentric component. Okay. So plyometrics is a, a very good example. Um, you know, bouncing up and down on one leg in a loaded position that mimics a landing position. I do a lot of those pulsing mm -hmm. in, uh, in the bow. I use the bow pulse, load the fascia at the end range. Um, it's almost like an isometric and this is a good, good segue into, you know, the difference between isometrics eccentrics isotonics and what it actually does to the body because um basically it's 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 like this you can load isometrically meaning in one place right and that's going to contract the muscle so so far the muscles contracted but the fascia is not going to move very much in the isometric way okay other than the muscle actually contracting itself so in that way it's a lot like concentric movement, right? Where you're shortening the muscle inside, but the connective tissue isn't very, doing very much. Okay. So both concentric and isometric, usually there's less of a load on the connective tissue. However, you can pulse, you can yeah. vibrate, you can, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to um, slow down quickly. And I'm just going to give some base definitions to people who might be listening sure. and don't know the definitions of like concentric, eccentric, isometric. Concentric is basically, if you think in terms of a lifting lens, let's say you're doing an overhead press. The concentric is when it starts at your shoulder and goes to your overhead position. That is the definition of a concentric movement. Eccentric would be you're taking it from that overhead position and you're lowering it back down to the starting position. That's your eccentric. So in, in easiest terms, the lift is the concentric, the lower is the eccentric. That's like the easiest way to understand it. Isometric is when you're holding something under tension statically, so you aren't moving at all. Um, what What's the definition of isotonic? Um, it, it, yeah, so that I'm gonna use isotonic and isometric as the same thing. I'll just use isometric, mm -hmm. okay? okay? So um, so yeah, that was, uh, do you have any questions on that or any thoughts on, on that type of training? Well, it's that that's from a lifting lens, right? And we're trying to apply it to a to a movement lens, right? And so I think the the big thing, the big aha moment for me recently in terms of shifting how I thought it, like I, I used to be very, very concentric dominant. And I pictured things like box jumps or jumping movements as concentric exclusive actions or things like medicine ball throws, because I thought like in my mind, it's like, okay, well, I'm I'm pushing it forward and I'm not lowering anything i thought i was lacking in eccentric action um but the the whole idea of like decelerating or bouncing out of the like for example like if i do a little bit of a knee bend and bounce before i before i jump that is almost like the the eccentric is kind of like the turnaround stimulation on my connective tissue right and when you're talking about this bouncing um plyometrics do have a bit of an eccentric action would you say Oh, definitely. Like that's, that's kind of the whole point of them is to use that stretch reflex out of the bottom. Mm. So you're, you're basically harnessing the stretch reflex, which is your fascia, um, increasing in length and you want to time out your muscular contraction to be able to harness that length. Okay. Now that that's probably the only time I actually use conscious effort is to do that. And while I'm doing a sport, I don't want the conscious effort. I'm not saying that. But I'll think about that. I'll think about where my, let's say I'm jumping up and down where my Achilles is maximally stretched and try to purposely pulse at that point. So I get that feeling of I'm, I'm getting, I'm harnessing everything correctly mm. or to the max. And then, you know, that's a form of training, a movement training, I would say, uh, pretty advanced. I wouldn't do it for a beginner. And then uh, transfer that into movement that's unconscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you seeing anyone who's doing some of this pulsing training? Like, that you that like who are, who are deliberately using maybe getting into a bow or into a position that they think is favorable and pulsing to train that sort of bounce quality. I haven't seen anyone like I, I'm sure there's people doing it. Like this is not a rocket science, <laughs> you know, type <laughs> of thing, right? Like yeah. people have been training plyometrics forever, so I'm sure they're doing it. But 
I haven't heard anyone kind of explain it the way I just did, right? Like to link it to eccentrics and to, to link it to the pulse or the timing of the pulse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I don't, yeah, I don't see a lot of people talking about that either necessarily. And we're talking about, we've, we've talked quite a bit about the idea of different stimulation, teaching our body to behave in a particular, or teaching our fascia to behave in a particular way. So when you're really emphasizing, or you really focused on um, like heavy lifting, you kind of turn your, like, like say you're, you're doing a lot of bench press and you're shortening and you're shortening, you're shortening, you're kind of training your fascial tissue that, that connective tissue web to kind of act like a power lifting suit. You know, like when people put on the, the two or three ply power lifting suits and they create more elasticity um, or they, they're so tense that when you get into that end range, it kind of bounces back. You're training your fascial tissue because you're shortening it over time. You're binding up the fibers quite a bit. You're teaching it to behave like a two ply or a three ply power lifting suit, right? Versus um, if you're doing some of this extended range, but like basically whatever you do in repetition over and over again, your, your body will optimize for over time. Right. And so Absolutely. Um, we're thinking in terms of what are, what are some of the most biomechanically efficient patterns? What do, what, what does, what, how do our joints want to move first and foremost? What are the patterns that our joints want to move through? And then what are the qualities of tissue that um, are sort of optimized for that particular, like we, we think a lot in terms of forward locomotion, and I think a little bit in terms of jumping, but I don't think jumping is like a really primary function of, of human biomechanics. Like we can jump, but we're not, we're not kangaroos. We don't locomote by like bouncing. We do have very, very springy Achilles tendons, like super thick developed Achilles tendons. Um, I think where the only animal that has comparable uh, Achilles tendon development is actually a kangaroo. So we do know that our, our, heel, our ankles and our heels are supposed to be springs essentially which I find really, really interesting. But the way that we do it, um, we, we, we're more contralateral versus um, kangaroos will jump bilaterally and that's their development. Where we're contralateral, we have more of a spiraling from side to side um, using those springs. So we're, we're thinking in terms of what are, the, what are the patterns and then what are the tissue qualities that accompany those patterns and how can we train that? I think that's been the, the biggest, like I, I've been doing a little bit of program jumping and hopping around and trying to train for multiple goals. And that's been the, the biggest mental block for me is like, I'm trying to think in terms of how can I train my body to be optimized to be a human body, essentially, while also, I think this is one of the topics that we were going to talk about. After we reach that baseline, is it healthy to try to exceed that baseline of, of human biomechanical efficiency to become like a superhuman in terms of extending your performance past a certain point. Like if you extend your performance past a certain point, even while respecting biomechanical um, laws, will that eventually have a point of diminishing returns on health, joint longevity, et cetera? And that's something that I'm, I'm really fascinated by. Yeah, if you're, if you're talking um, specializing within a sport, of course, there's going to be uh, consequences to putting your energy towards one thing. If we're talking more... Um, how do I say this? Like first principles about it, then I think that, I think it's the same thing. You have to optimize towards being human. Okay. And that was, I use the go to principles, right. As my foundation towards what is natural. However, the question arises, can we go beyond natural and still stay healthy? Is that more your question? Yeah. Well, that was yeah. like, yeah. After we have kind of optimized for those global laws of human biomechanics after we have you know reestablished good biomechanics good connective tissue quality um can we start extending and maximizing on those things like okay here here's the pattern of locomotion now that we've coded it back into our nervous system can we do it to run faster or longer um or at, is there a threshold of where you know because there is a baseline for human biomechanics is there a baseline for what you know like obviously the human body is incredibly adaptable and our morphology will change based on the demands that we put on it. But is there going to be a point where we, even if we're, even if our training is optimized for perfect biomechanics and per and respects human nature in every possible way is trying to advance that capacity. Is that going to eventually lead to joint longevity or is like the, 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 the sweet spot of quote health 
uh, a point where you don't have too much athletic um, advancement, so to speak, you know, like that's, that's the question that I've been kind of pondering um, because one of the things that I thought about is like, okay, well, you know, a lot of my ab development, a lot of this, it really inhibited my natural breathing capacity. And um, I was visiting a friend the other day and I saw her, her baby walking around with the, the big stomach and he's breathing these big stomach breaths. And I, I look at the, the development of different apes that are, you know, like have a similar genetic makeup to humans and, and they have these somewhat distended stomachs. And I, I, and even when you're watching um, indigenous cultures, they kind of have that like almost lumbar lordosis with a little bit of a distended stomach and they're breathing right into their diaphragms. And I, I can't help but wonder, it's like, okay, if you're maximizing locomotive capacities, you're maximizing these biomechanical capacities. Um, if you try to push past that point to advance your athleticism, are you going to decrease your health? That's, that's the ultimate question that I've been kind of like contemplating and keeping me up at night. It's, it's very interesting because, uh, let's say you take a system like Gota, right? And they say the indigenous, uh, haven't been touched by Western culture is really the pinnacle of what you're looking for. And they have very good to great biomechanics, go to tens or whatever. Right. Um, could someone like whack visit that village and show them the double down pulse or the, you know, how to optimize their side movement and increase their athleticism without decreasing their health. I believe that there's wiggle room there. Absolutely. You can still optimize. Like for me, I use a lot of the winging pulses in the upper body that I know from WEC and I use it with the go to footwork and the global laws and I intermix them and I feel like I'm not losing anything. I'm gaining. So I don't think natural is always better. I think it's better 95% of the time. And there's a little bit of wiggle room there for you to play with. Um, and I don't think that either one, I think it's a logical fallacy actually to say that a baby has perfect biomechanics. And I've heard this from DNS people for sure. Um, I can play a recording about it. The, the issue with the baby being a model for perfect biomechanics is, is babies uh, will imitate the people around them. Like the, the way that they learn is by observing and copying. Like we have mirror neurons. Humans have mirror neurons that force us to like internally copy what we see. And when you're a baby, it's funny because like, you know, like I said, I was going to visit my friend and her, one of her kids loves me. And so she ran up and gave me a big hug and like was hugging me. And then the baby runs up and looks up and goes, I want a hug. <laughs> it's literally just doing what the, what, what his sister is doing. Right. And you, you can see video. There was a really good video you sent me like months ago of this, uh, this kid following around the grandpa and he was walking around like the grandpa with the same like duck foot, like funny, like penguin walk almost. Um, yeah. because human beings will, will mirror and mimic what they see. So a baby is not a good example, maybe an indigenous baby where, where they're already walking with perfect biomechanics. Um, you know, that indigenous baby might show really good, you know, youthful joints and, and mimicking the, the parents that are already in good biomechanics, but using a baby as an example, maybe to, like you can, even using the baby crawl as the example, yeah, there's an intuitive way that babies will crawl, but they'll also compensate. They'll, they'll figure out a way to, to wiggle themselves forward to get the cookie no matter what, right? Even if they don't you know, exactly know the most efficient way to do it, it's not like they suddenly find the perfect biomechanical way exactly. to contralaterally move with this perfect rotation of the hips and the, and the shoulders. Like it's not, it's, it's, it's pretty funny. Um, so I don't think using a baby as an example for perfect biomechanics is great. <laughs> I don't. No, they have different uh, strategies. Like I can show you a hundred different ways that a baby moves. And some of them are really funny. You know what I mean? Like yeah. um, some of them look like bear crawls. Some of them are moving sideways. It's um, There's a lot of variation there. And I did hear a DNS person say that uh, a baby, you know, around a year or two years is in perfect biomechanics. However, I don't think that they're, they're obviously not neurologically developed. Well, and that, and so Rudy is actually in the audience right now and he, he just left a comment and he said he had some awesome food for thought from Eugene Teo, which was that a baby's head is also approximately a third of its body weight, which would certainly affect its biomechanics. So of course, sure. like if we were walking around with our head weighing about a, a third <laughs> as much as the rest of our body, we'd be, we would be locomoting differently as adults, right? So using a baby as an example of perfect biomechanics a little bit silly 
I'm just saying that like for that, when I keep looking into it and I keep listening to more and more DNS uh, people who, who look at baby development, mm. uh, um, one, there's a million different strategies. Two, how do you know that like when I hear them talking about it, they go, well, this happened to develop these muscles and then these muscles developed because of the crawl. It's like, how do you know it's not backwards? Every human developed their musculature unless there's a, you know an error or something like that every human develops their musculature, you will all have a uh, psoas muscle. It will all be working, every single one of you. How do you know that you can extrapolate the fact that you crawled to that uh, that variable, right? Because I, I talked to somebody today, and he's like, oh, yeah, I hardly crawled. I, I went straight to walking. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. I'm like, interesting. Um, so how did you develop your psoas then? Because according to these guys, that's how you develop muscles in sequence. I just think they took... Everybody having muscular development and then extrapolated that it comes from crawling. But I don't think you can actually prove that, right? So I think there's a lot of assertions there that are uh, first principles that are on shaky foundations. However, there's a lot of, like I'm not completely uh, dismissing DNS because I like a lot of their ideas. And I do think crawling is developmental. Yeah. However, I don't think that the hard conclusion should be made. Well, it's really interesting. There was a documentary that I watched, and it was a documentary that had no narration. It was all footage. It was called Babies, and it was four babies from around the world. I think it was the U.S., Japan, Mongolia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And it was really interesting to see the different development in these babies. It was basically filming these babies within the first 18 months of their development or something. The Sub-Saharan Africa kid that was in this tribe basically you know like not born born in the dirt uh you know like had his ass wiped with a, a corn cob kind of thing like this this little kid was walking around and just behaving like a person months before the other babies like the mongolians had their baby like super wrapped tight and like up against the chest for a long time and never really like had like I do think that how a baby is allowed to express its behavior will affect its development. There's a lot of really good information developmentally showing that like if a baby's put in a jolly jumper, for example, it's going to affect their hips, right? It'll affect their hip development. They'll start to develop uh, duct feet and they won't be able, they, they don't support themselves because um, the human body is still adaptable, right? Like obviously the things that you do will affect your development, but is it necessary for you to go from, you do this exact crawl to develop your psoas, and then then you can stand up, and then you can start walking? It's like, mm, probably not. <laughs> well, think about like the pinnacle right now for the industry is mobility and, and stability, but mostly mobility. I have range of motion, and I can express it, therefore everything's good, right? Um, so a baby does have that. Right, it is able to express its limbs in every single direction, and has that freedom. So under that model, it is more of a you know perfect biomechanical model. But they're forgetting the neurological input, the movement, the mm -hmm. the fact that you have to groove movement in. They're looking at more like a blank slate. Like, oh, look at this blank slate; it's perfect, but the movement's not there yet. No, it's not. Like, it, and and it's not there in the same way. Not all babies crawl. So like, I I don't get that conclusion. Maybe someone can help me out there. I don't know. I, I think it's just looking at, you know, it's, it would logically make sense if you don't think too deeply about it. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, babies go through this phase of development. So this must be why their muscles develop a certain way. It's like, well, also like human beings have evolved over a very, very long period of time. And, you know, our, our bodies are pre-programmed genetically to, to develop in a certain way. We still need a certain level of uh, adaptive stimulus and, and the challenges to develop, obviously, but we're biologically sort of almost predetermined to develop a certain way, at least in my, my perspective. Like we have a genetic memory, quote unquote, that sort of, it's like we have a blueprint. We have a species appropriate blueprint that, you know, the same way that we have the same color eyes as our parents, like we have the same sort of muscular development as our, our ancestors for thousands, hundreds, thousands, millions of years, I think. Anyway, that's my that's my perspective on it. So it's like, yes, it's it's nature and nurture, right? Like the, the nature is going to dictate that it's going to be easier for us to develop at a certain rate in a certain way. And then the nurture is like, well, we still have the adaptive stimulus of like, maybe we do develop muscles crawling and stabilizing ourselves. Maybe we do 
develop, you know, this, this forward posture because when we're, we're face down as a baby and we're looking up, right, we're developing those muscles to be back chain dominant, right? That, that does make sense to me. It makes sense logically and like the way you're saying it. However, there's a million variables. And how do you prove, like what, everything you said sounds great, right? But how do you prove that? How do you take out the variables and say, this is what did it right well, here? Yeah, and, and I think that's the, like the one thing that I've noticed about functional fitness in the biomechanics sphere uh, and about fitness in general and nutrition and anything pertaining to health is you can say things that sound true. There was, uh, I remember reading about this thing where uh, I think in Merriam Webster, they added this uh, word to the dictionary called truthiness, where it's like you can say something that sounds true, even if it isn't. Like it can sound super logically consistent, but not backed up by any facts, not backed up by any verifiable sources, not backed up by anything. But it's like it has a high degree of truthiness to it. Like it's like, wow, that really sounds like it could be true. So it must be. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, 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 go ahead. I really think this comes down to how you do figure this stuff out, right? So for me, it's first principles. I want to know, like, when somebody tells me that, let's say somebody told me about DNS and they're like, the baby definitely develops its psoas because he does this. I'm like, okay, then, like, how did you get that idea? I want to know that. Where did you actually get this idea? And where did that person get the idea? Okay. And like, if it's there, it's there, right? But if I dig into the original materials and it's on a shaky foundation, then I don't put it as complete truth, mm. right? Where a lot of people will just take the first principles that they heard and assume them to be true. And it's right. like, if you want to do your own investigation, you have to actually go to the source. What is the first principle? Where did you actually get this idea? And I'm more interested in that when I'm speaking or trying to debate somebody now, it's more like, where did you actually come up with that idea? Where is the source of this idea? Because it's being asserted as truth. However, it may not be on completely solid foundation. And, and the thing is, like, a lot of the times I feel like the what's can be right. Like, people can make the correct observations, but then they'll extrapolate and create whys out of thin air. Right. So it's like, for example, it's like, oh, we see the slowest development in babies and the why is because they crawl, <laughs> you know, and they, they like, they extrapolate and they make these, like, it's broad assumptions about um, the, the whys, right? Based on the, the observations. Again, the observations might be completely and totally correct. Maybe developmentally, a baby does develop its psoas and, and then that's what uh, stabilizes it to be able to start walking better. And like, maybe that is actually what happens, but the extrapolation of it's like, well, it's because they crawl. It's like, Mm, how, are, how are you arriving at that conclusion, right? And so I like exactly. the idea of, of using first principles as, as sort of the, the guiding foundation as I come back to the first principles idea so that you, well, and, and that's also a really good foundation to have. Like you need to have the correct first principles. Otherwise, every other assumption that you're going to make and everything else that you're going to build, every other argument that you're building on is going to be wrong fundamentally. And I know like we've had, we've had a few discussions with some people, like when we had uh, Quran on for, from the flowability, we, I think we had a different level of um, fundamental first principles understanding of biomechanics in general, because they, sure. they were working on that um, mobility stability model, where it's like, well, you got to stabilize that middle section of the lumbar and have mobile hips and have uh, you know, mobile shoulders. And if you keep this stable, you're going to get mobility here. And, and we're, we're thinking in terms of a totally different paradigm, a totally different level of first principles, right? And so there was there there was a fundamental disconnect when we were interviewing him. I was trying to find the connections, but and because the first principles were so different, it was really really hard to have a conversation to see where the overlap was. Sometimes there is a like uh, that's what I want to dig down to. It's like where is your first principle, and if it's not the same that I have, it's, that's fine. Yeah, I, I'm cool with that, right? Like um, you're using a different model. We're not all going to come from the same models because. Basically, that's how knowledge is created or, or built up, right? Like you, you have a model and you're like, I'm going to improve on this model, right? But you may not have even agreed on the original model, right? So I'm not even, there's nothing wrong with having disagreements on first principles. I just want to figure out where they are, right? And it's very difficult to do, like, in, especially now, everyone's very 
like they don't want to dig down to the first principles. It gets heated before that on many different right. fronts, many right. different subjects, right? But if we could find the first principles, where are you actually getting this information? Where's the first place and what model are you using to assume that your information is correct? Hmm. And it doesn't even have to be peer reviewed or anything. It could be just like, I think that's the case, right? And um, that, that's fine, right? That's not a high level of evidence, but I'm cool with that too. If that's what you think, that's fine, right? So it doesn't have to be, I'm not looking for someone to give me the best evidence. I'm looking for, where did you get this? Yeah, and, and sometimes learning about a person's thought process um, kind of gives you more insight into their create like their capacities to glean information. Like some people have a very non-linear mind and some people have an extremely linear mind, right? You tend to find the people who are very data driven, uh, who are just always looking for a meta analysis of, of like whatever peer reviewed studies that you get, they're very linear cause and effect um, type people. Whereas you get a lot of people, like I find at least in my experience and in interacting with the more movement functional fitness space, you get a lot more nonlinear thinkers and creative types who are willing to observe beyond uh, just the information and the interpretation of observation. Like people are observing and they're trying to, to have a more open creative approach to understanding what they're seeing. And the result is more innovation, right? Like you get, you get a guy like a Gill who is, you know, equating human movement to a hurricane or you get a guy like Naudi Aguilar who's who's viewing these fascial lines and understanding how force is transferring through them and how he's equating it to this, you know, this he's like literally developing cable systems so that he could create certain force vectors along these fascial lines. Like that's that requires non-linear creative thinking to be able to innovate this stuff. Yeah, but he's still building upon models that he had before, right? So yeah. I think looking at Naudi, probably like I I'm almost certain he built of uh, Tom Myers, right? The anatomy trains, the, the fascial tensions. Um, so he used that model as his first principle to start his other journey towards actual like um, sling system training, I guess you can call it chamber sequences, all that stuff, right? So if let's say Tom Myers was completely incorrect, which I don't think he is, but let's say he was completely incorrect, the fascia does nothing and it's all muscles and single lever systems. You're going to be building like now we would be building off the wrong model. However, I don't think Paul Myers is correct. I think he's very correct. Um, not a hundred percent, but the fascia is definitely trainable. It's a, it's a way to harness elasticity and efficiency. So let's start training it. And really now was the first one to do it in the industry anyway, and in a big way. Well, he, he was the first, I mean, like he interviewed Tom Myers, um, I feel like Tom Meyer's work with anatomy trains was really limited to a lot of physical therapists and manual therapists. So people who were kind of working more in, in your field, like the chiropractics, the massage therapists, um, and yoga looking at, and, and yoga. Yeah, exactly. So you didn't have a lot of people who are looking at, um, like physical training and resistance training, uh, thinking about the fascia in mind. And even, you know, I, I sometimes, because we talked about the effect of concentric actions, on the, the effect on fascial tissue and the effect of like concentric training is principally muscular dominant. When I see some of the stuff that Naudi does with the, the regen trainer and the cables that he's doing in the parabar, it looks very concentric dominant to me. And maybe there's like, there might be, in fact, there probably is nuance that I'm missing. And I will say that, but when I look at it intuitively, it looks concentric dominant and it looks like there's a lot of Again, you're doing some of this isometric stuff to lock in the, the scapula and then you're moving and you're working against this force vector and it's contractile and you're almost like you're, crea you're creating a frame through contractile effort. And for me, it's like he's still, he's still working with uh, the parabol, so you're still having parabolic forces. You're still working with clubs. You're still working with a lot of these things that you know that, that work the elastic sling system. You see him slinging around a mace a lot. So there is that element of training that is fundamentally a part of functional patterns. But a lot of FP guys that I see, it's like it looks like they're doing a lot of concentric, trying to build this frame with a concentric dominant approach. Well, it's, it's interesting that you say that because uh, what I observed is 
functional patterns is one of the systems that actually moves a lot during their uh during their training right they actually move from point a to point b okay so the concentric dominant stuff to me is more standing still mm. now I, I would say that uh functional patterns does more tension like pulling tension let's say i'm holding the para bar back here like this mm -hmm. and my pelvis and my ribs are separating like turning one's turning one way the other one's turning counter right mm -hmm. in between the tension is being increased on the connective tissue the fascia mm -hmm. between the two points and then it's being used elastically as you move through space okay so that to me isn't concentric it's still I wouldn't know what to call it, to be honest. Um, it's more tension training, right? Which is kind of where I go with it. I, I don't think eccentric. I don't think concentric anymore. I just use the terminology because it's the terminology everybody uses. I think more intentions personally. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and so so you're thinking, in, uh, it's, it's interesting that you said intentions because yeah. um, I, I think in terms of intention and then you're thinking in terms of tension as well right and so i think i think that's uh, those are two you know intention and in tension those are two things that are are both you know how how i think in terms of now um i don't think in terms of tension created through an active effort of trying to contract necessarily um i try to create the appropriate joint angles and i will try to load myself properly and i'll i'll try to um create biomechanically good movement and try to clean that up as much as possible. And that for me is intentional, but then you're also creating tension through that intention. Yeah. That's, I, it, it's I, an so, interesting point. Yeah. Um, cause, cause we talked about, um, we, we just had that episode with Brian Mirabella where, where he talked about, um, the primary driver of locomotion was the breath or in, was intention, the intention to, to move forward. I think that's pretty interesting in in theory. And I, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this a lot, actually, because Goda, um, as a movement system, has the goal of recoding your subconscious mechanics, your subconscious behavior. Behavior, right? yeah. Right? And so um, what you do, like, you can have the, the intention to locomote forward, and you can do that regardless of how good your mechanics are, right? Like that, that is the pri the primary driver of locomotion is your consciousness. You're, you're driving forward biomechanically. What is, what are some of the factors that determine good transfer of energy, good force transfer of energy. And that, I think that was when we were having the spinal engine debate, that was kind of, for me, Whereas the originator of this transference of force was kind of more what I was thinking we were going to talk about, but then because we used the language, what's the primary driver of locomotion, we ended up getting into the logistics debate of like, well, what is this linguistically or should we change the linguistics of it more or less, right? But that, that shows the importance of a really good question, right? Yes, exactly. Like having the right question. But it, it was it was good because um it unpacks the ideas. It opens a door, right? Even though we didn't maybe ask the right question, uh, it opened the door to a lot more, right? I, I think we all expanded from that, um, from that debate, even if forget about who was right or who was wrong or whatever, it was, everyone learned quite a bit and got the wheels turning in the brain. Right. And what you said with intentions versus tensions, it's kind of like, I, I agree with breathing with Brian, Brian Mirabella, and I agree with Weck that intention is the thing that sets everything off. Your intention to move, because the body to me is an electrical system. Okay. I'm I'm an electrical being. Uh and that is the nervous system. That is the nervous system giving code to for me to move, right? So that is the driver of locomotion more than anything biomechanically, in my opinion. All the parts start to synchronize and that's what you're looking for in the actual physical biomechanics but the intentions can't be separated from the biomechanics your brain your being your spirit your whatever you want to say your electricity cannot be separated from the biomechanics and we try to do it because it's a biomechanics podcast <laughs> but really we're humans right so well that's like you know humans aren't robots but if we're using an analogy you could have like the most powerful robot in the world that can locomote super super fast forward 
But if you don't have anything charging it and you don't have anything powering it, it's not going to move, right? And so ultimately, like movement is is driven by that electrical force. It is driven by the nerve impulses that are, are you know, interacting within our nervous system and innervating every part of our body that coordinates this symphony happen. Like, you know, like even just a flick of the hand when I'm doing these like hand gestures as I'm talking, that is like a bioelectrical storm that's happening through my body that is signaling this perfect sequence of firing of, of, of coordinating this movement. And, and that's where Brian really shined there because he was talking about the conductivity of your fascia, it being more like a battery pack on the inside is what does the contraction, but the outside is like the battery pack powering that contraction. And you need to have it uh, healthy. That starts with oxygenation, uh, hydration, not being compressed. Otherwise, the fluid can't go through. You can't get that electrical conductivity. I think uh, Brian was right, right on about that. Yeah, I, I think he was too. And, that, and it's interesting because I always thought in terms, I did think in terms of the hydration, and I did think in terms of uh, mineral consumption. I know that like a lot of people end up being really magnesium deficient. Uh, sometimes have a pretty poor balance of sodium to potassium because we tend to eat more salt than potassium, and so your sodium potassium balance is bad. That affects nerve conductivity. Um, I remember even like experiencing a cognitive boost after fasting for a little while with a really nice ratio of potassium to sodium. I was just drinking uh, salt and potassium chloride and uh, for like three days and like within two days, my, my mental acuity was like at an all time high after a while, you know, you fast for a long time, your mental acuity starts to go down was the declining effect. But um, you know, it was, it was, I was, basically consuming a really nice ratio of potassium, sodium, and magnesium. And my nerve, my nerve conductivity was really, really high. And there wasn't anything else that was necessarily uh, inhibiting that. So I, I do think, that, so I thought in terms of that, but I never really considered the oxygenation part, like you know, breathing, breathing biomechanics. Um, I've always done breath work just as a, a fascinating thing. It's like one of the things that I've, you know, because I have a, a history of meditating quite a bit. I used to meditate every day, sometimes for hours a day. And breathing was always a really, really big part of that. So um, thinking about in terms of the actual biomechanics, like when you talked about certain levels of oxygenation and car uh, carbon dioxide tolerance as sort of this way that your, your nervous system signals your capacity to relax certain tissues. That was something that's like, I'd never, never in a million years would have thought about that on my own. Absolutely. Um, it's funny because a lot of the techniques that I use breathing, like I, I had a heavy practice. I think Brian would just be like, that's terrible. Right. <laughs> um, and, and to be honest, I, I did do a lot of, relaxing the diaphragm and letting the breath come in through the nose. I have done that before, right? Like as a, a base practice, but I was doing a lot of the heavy breathing through my mouth with a device that blocks the air, thinking that it's going to strengthen my diaphragm. Like I'm almost strength training my diaphragm to be able to unlock. And I was doing a lot of the actually flowability type things where I'd lift my legs that puts tension in the diaphragm. I have the mouthpiece and I breathe as hard as I can into that mouthpiece. And it really does pull the diaphragm. Now, I don't know if that's good or bad, right? Like, um, I was more experimenting on myself, but I think Brian's right in that at a higher level, you kind of just have to let it go and breathe through your nose and make it simple. Right. right. And I like it how he, I don't know if he even mentioned this, but I, I heard it somewhere else where he was saying, don't actually exercise to your capacity beyond what you can breathe through your nose. And then just work it up like that versus going hard, trying to breathe through your nose, losing it. And then you don't get that training effect. Well, this is a, a pretty fundamental idea of aerobic based training. I, I read a really great book by um, Mark Sisson and Brad Kern. It's called Primal Endurance. And their whole thing was that most people you know, push their aerobic zone too hard and they end up in this like zone three uh, training, which is very glycolytic and doesn't actually build an aerobic base very well. And, and, you know, there's a few ways to get into that aerobic zone where you can build this really great aerobic base. The bigger your aerobic base, the idea is the, the, the more endurance and the more high output stuff that you can get, the faster you recover even from high intensity activity. And like, 
you can even look at studies of like bodybuilders, powerlifters, et cetera. If they have a good aerobic base, they're recovering between sets faster even. You know, this isn't just like endurance sports. And the way that they said you should have this aerobic base training period is when you're running, you shouldn't like there's there's a heart rate zone that you can do, which is 180 minus your age. You shouldn't go above that, basically. That's your your heart rate maximum for aerobic based training. But they're like, if you want to keep it simple, just only go as hard as you can while still breathing gently through your nose. Not like, you know, like crazy <laughs> super nose breathing, but like just, just like easy breathing through your nose in and out, right? Yeah, it's it's interesting that you say that because there's oxygenation obviously like tissues love oxygenation even uh dylan white who got knocked out by tyson fury the other night they immediately just put him on oxygen because they know that a heavy dose of oxygen is going to revitalize you okay we can talk about the physiology behind it but basically a lot of oxygen revitalizes you quick the question is what's the hack here right the hack to me biomechanically is if you have stuck tissue if your tissue isn't perfused in a certain area, like has blood flow or lymph flow going through it. If it's stuck, you're not going to get oxygenated there. So you're not going to have that tissue be vital. And, uh, there's hacks for this, right? I use cupping high power, right? Has to be done a certain way, but it high power cupping, you can do, um, what ATG does is short range training. So almost concentric training. So I think they use the sled going backwards to pump blood into the quads that's their thought process more blood more repair and that's true to a certain degree right the question is doing it without uh unpatterning yourself i guess you can say <laughs> put yourself in reverse gear okay because i do think that's a thing and uh yeah so basically oxygenation through getting your tissues to unstick to each other layers of tissue is super important and that's healthy fascia is going to help you get there but you may already have scar tissue in a certain area from injury from not moving it correctly from you know there's lots of reasons it could happen so i think naudi's pretty far into this type of thing and i think uh who else atg is is kind of into it where blood flow and fluid to a certain area is very important yeah well that's their that's their differentiation between short range short range training is basically that to them they'll they'll do um you know a lot of band work even like a lot of people w with atg will see just the backward sled pull and it's a short range movement but you can also see people who are working in atg with a lot of bands so if you're trying to repair your your bicep tendon for example you can use a light band and then you're only like you can do a bicep curl with a band and you're only really getting a strong contraction at the short range of the movement, like bands are almost an automatic short range training. Um, to Will's point, it's, uh, you kind of have the issue of maybe you're putting yourself in reverse gear. Maybe you are screwing yourself over. Um, Steven Luker is asking, I don't know if this relates to any movements of anything, but is there a way to prevent nosebleed with any movements? I actually don't know. I've never dealt with nosebleeds myself. I've never looked into it. And I feel like nose bleeding is probably a multifactorial thing. It's not like there's probably not one universal cause. Like you could literally yeah. have a nosebleed because the climate is too dry. Um, you know, like some people stop no having their nosebleeds when they put a humidifier in the room kind of thing. But 100%. off the top of your head, is there, is there any like biomechanical, like I can't think of a biomechanical. I, there's, that's multifactorial. You got to get it diagnosed. There's, there's a million reasons that could happen. Um, yeah, I, I can't say anything to that. What you were saying before, um, I only caught a little bit of it, to be honest. But when we're talking about blood flow restriction training, did you mention that? I didn't. I didn't uh, mention blood flow restriction. I was talking. So, so I was talking about how ATG uses bands. Oh, okay. Um, so that when they and and they'll wait until the very end of the range, they'll do high repetition stuff with bands. So if you're doing like a bicep curl, you're only really getting a lot of contraction at the end range of the movement. And so it's short range training because you have a low resistance at the top, high resistance at the short range. And that's mm -hmm. sort of the, that's their mentality. Like that's the other thing that the, you don't see on Instagram as much because it's not as like flashy as the walking backwards with a sled sort of thing, but that's the other way that they use their short range training. Interesting. And the goal there is blood flow for, for that particular one. Yeah. So I, would, I wouldn't. Like, you don't get as much tissue damage that way they say, but it's mostly blood flow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Feel well, really good. You get a, you get a pretty decent pump that way. Well, there you go. Uh, there's the first principle, right? Like there's, 
okay, they're doing it because this, I wouldn't personally do that because I don't want to shorten my muscles like that and keep them in tension. I have better ways of perfusing, uh, you know, perfusing areas, putting blood within the area, right? Like, and that goes back to blood flow restriction. And what I see with most cupping, most cupping is terrible. It's like, you're putting the cup on the same spot and keeping the same blood in there for a long time. That's why you have the terrible bruising. It's like you, blood has to exchange nutrients. If you're keeping the same stagnant blood in an area, you're just bruising and there it's doing like, I wouldn't say it's doing harm, but it's not doing very much and it's not penetrating deep. You have to penetrate deep. Like I, I don't get some therapists. Like they're like, don't go deep. It's, it's not to be done. It's like, you know what else doesn't go deep doing nothing. Right. So um, you have to stimulate the tissue that you need to stimulate. And sometimes that tissue is next to a bone and you got to go deep, but you want to be targeted as well. Right. So, so there's that. And, and same thing with blood flow restriction training to a lesser degree, you're keeping the same blood in the area and you're increasing the pressure. Yeah. There could be some hypertrophy effects, but in terms of blood flow perfusion, you're keeping the same blood in the area. It can only exchange so many nutrients before it becomes stagnant. And, um, I've never heard I've never heard that argument before, and I find that's really interesting. Which I guess is why you do the you do the high powered cupping stuff, right? Like as opposed to just you know, get a pump and and recirculate the same blood over and over again. So that's yeah. that's really fascinating. So um, we we covered a lot of ground today. We sort of started um, with the idea of of fascia and, and muscle being two different dynamic things, and how fascia really is the thing that absorbs or, or takes in the most sensory information. It's the most proprioceptive uh, information processing center of your body compared to your muscles. And your muscles, your actin and myosin fibers, um, they might be innervated, but the only thing that they really do is contract or relax. They aren't, uh, they aren't as intelligent, quote unquote, they aren't as information processing as your fascial fibers, right? And so you can, you can train in a muscular way by, by doing a lot of concentric training or a lot of isometric training where you're contracting this muscle, but this muscle is within the fascia fiber and is surrounded by this, this connective tissue, these connective tissues that are innervated and have more nerve uh, signaling. So when you're training, you, you want to think in terms of a connective tissue approach as well. Yes, it's okay to train muscles if your goals are bigger muscles. But again, we, we, we didn't even cover, that, you know, like what, what goals people have necessarily. We've talked about it a lot, but we're going to assume that anyone listening to a goal about biomechanics or a podcast about biomechanics are going to have the goal to improve their biomechanics and their uh, connective tissue longevity. Did you have any other points that I missed that you wanted to kind of summarize and revisit? Um, not really like kind of just what you said there. Um, it can easily be debunked everything that we said today with a scientific paper because they don't look at fascia, right? There's not like the overwhelming 99% of papers don't even mention fascia. They only mention muscle, which cannot be separated from fascia. But guess what? When I did cadaver class and everyone else who did cadaver class, medical students, physios, chiropractic, um, you took out the fascia. We didn't work with it. We cut it up and it's gone. And then it's like, oh, it's connective tissue. Cut it and then get to the muscle. The muscle is what's important. So how are you supposed to study something when you don't even recognize its importance and then you use the studies as justification for saying that, no, that's not how it works, right? Or to just ignore it, right? So ignore ants on that, right? Um, yeah, so that's just my thoughts on on the thought process behind it. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and again, like we're, we're trying to look at alternative information to the mainstream narrative of, of things, right? We're looking, we still, we'll still look at the merits mainstream narrative on a lot and we, t we still have a lot of discussions about you know different different ideas and topics that are you know passed through the gatekeepers of academic institutions but we are we're trying to provide alternative information on biomechanics as well by looking at different things like anatomy trains like go to movement like observing movement so efren is just asking hey guys will what cups do you use are they available online and does your strategy or technique you use have a name or is it your own and i know that you like you can, you can answer that. Uh, it's my own. Um, I customized the, the whole system to fit the body. Um, it's not available anywhere. I, I'm the only one doing it. We are going to eventually 
uh, build and manufacture, I think what, what you, what you put together. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, you, you have your own high, high power cupping vacuum and you created your own cups for it. And so you can't actually commercially buy it anywhere cause we'll need them. Um, but one of our longer term plans is to, um, you know, get it properly patented and properly manufactured and, and have, uh, education where, where you can actually use them because he has each one of the cups is custom fitted to different parts of the body and so you know we're, we're going to make sure that it's it's available it's definitely dangerous to do if you, if you don't know what you're doing because of the high power um i wouldn't recommend <laughs> yeah so it, it, you, you definitely want to know the protocols which i've gone through for five years and really honed hone that in um it's not something you want to mess with it's high power on a body right so it's not so yeah it's like diy yeah. Sort of like Will's, Will's been doing it with uh, clients, you know, like patients, for over five years, and he developed yeah. this system over a long period of time, right? So, um, <laughs> that's that's the other thing is like we can talk about different ideas and different techniques, but like don't jump and try to DIY everything yourself that you hear on the podcast because it can, you know, Will Will is a is a chiropractor with a with a professional practice, right? And so. Um, when we talk about some of the techniques and you're like, oh, wow, high powered cupping, and you go, go get a vacuum cleaner and you start <laughs> you know, trying to do yeah. high powered cupping with a vacuum cleaner. It's like you're going to get you, you can mess yourself up. Right. So it'll be less beneficial than you think. It I'm, is. I'm not using the Dyson V10 and just vacuuming people. <laughs> I will say, though, so I, I uh, you know, Will and I live pretty close to each other and I've been in. in gotten treatments from this high powered cupping stuff. And, you know, like I, you know, I had my shoulder surgery and stuff and felt really limited in terms of the range of motion that I could access pain free, but will spent about like 15, 20 minutes just cupping it with, uh, with his technique and the range of motion that I had, I got like an extra four inches of, of range. I could put my hand over my head. I could do all kinds of stuff that I couldn't do in like a single session. And uh, I actually uh, like I spent the last month in Mexico. I can't wait to go back now, just so that I can uh, go go and uh, go and get some more treatment done and uh, and get some movement sessions in again. Yeah, I feel like I can't wait. It's gonna be awesome. You're back. You're back tomorrow, eh? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm back. I'm back in the Rockies tomorrow, and then we can uh, we can put together some more video content. But anyways, man, I think this is a good place to wrap it up. This is episode 52 of the Art of Move. We've been jabbing for a good hour if you guys want to check out our stuff we're now available on youtube which is pretty cool i'm going to be uploading every one of our video replays on youtube as always they're going to be available on nofilter.net as well in my content vault where you can also see the upcoming live streams where you can ask questions like people have in the chat today uh, you can even hit the knock button and join in the conversation live on stream if you ever want to um, this is where we're going to be recording for the foreseeable future um, if you're listening to us on iTunes or Spotify, please leave us a rating or a review. I really, really appreciate it. It helps our visibility, helps us grow the podcast, helps get this information to more people that might need it. You can follow me at The Body Moves on Instagram, and you can follow Will at The Art of Move on Instagram. Thanks for listening, guys. Episode 52 in the books. We'll catch you next time. Have a good one, guys.